Welcome to week six of Regenerative Soil Microscopy. I'm your host, Matt Powers. Let's dive into fungi. So I am so excited to talk to you about this because this is an area that has been disconnected and a lot of things said about, a lot of things misunderstood, a lot of things focused on that weren't as important. But <clears throat> let's begin with what you'll most commonly see. Okay, let's just start there because this is at 40X. You'll see these little root-like things, these dendritic things, these twig-like, stick-like things. Let me kind of zoom in at 40X. This is 100X. This is 400X. You can start to see the structure, the morphological characteristics, and even more so at 600X. But that's saprophytic fungi. Saprophytic. Breaks down dead and decomposing organic matter. Those can be endophytes. And, and, and the endophytes that are fungi tend to be yeasts. And then in, in terms of just endophytes in general, that they're primarily bacteria. Fungal saprophytes do not become mycorrhizal fungi. They don't like shift families and types into that. They just don't cross that barrier. The fungal saprophytes, can, some of them are endophytes, but primarily not the ones that we get out of compost. And it's yeasts and they don't become mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi depend on the plant roots to survive. So they stay in the rhizosphere. They release spores that stay in the rhizosphere. They inhabit the roots and then the root chunks become propagules and carries on into the next season. But wait, what is fungi? Fungi are eukaryotes. They're eukaryotic microbes that are significantly larger than bacteria on average. So when we look at bacteria, yes, it has a wide range, but predominantly it's much smaller. And then fungi, there's there seems to be that overlap down there with yeasts. But yeasts, when you see them in context, are generally bigger than everything bacteria-wise. So we have to keep that in mind, especially because you know, the larger things are going to be like streptomyces in bacterial range and, and spirochetes and other things that are really huge, but they're not, they're, they're, they're so morphologically different that we can see those differences. So you see fungi on the right, you see bacteria on the left pr predominantly. And then when we break it down even further, it, it becomes very interesting. We see actinobacteria, we see our muscular mycorrhizal fungi having a total overlap. And then you go down to the bottom and you see average soil hyphae and you see how that is arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, that's white rot, that's brown rot, that's trichoderma, that's, you know what I mean? There's, there's all these things that overlap with that, that space. So you can have a lot of hyphae that looks the same size but they could be from totally different parts of the uh, of the fungal kingdom. There are a few larger sized bacteria and several prominent filamentous bacteria that are large that we've talked about. So when you're like eukaryotic, what, what, what? They contain a nucleus or nuclei, so multiple nucleuses. And so, th th so they have organelles with membranes that are different, that, that are separate from the other parts of the cell. And, and, and that, that is different from bacteria. Remember, they're prokaryotic. So this is more like animals. Our muscular mycorrhizal fungi actually collects nuclei? Yeah. And we'll talk about more about this in a second, but they collect the nuclei from other species and other phyla, and they can shoot them off from their spores. And since they can do that in response to their environment, they literally can trigger successional change across species and across phylum but through their spores. So it's it's really incredibly wild what's possible when you think from the the potential of collecting multiple nuclei and expressing what you need when. That's what our muscular mycorrhizal fungi does. And this is from regenerative soil. You can read more about it in detail there. They really are being able to 
supply the responses by borrowing from other people's genetics to the needs of the environment and the needs of the biology in the moment and the plants of the moment. So these are the key reasons why fungi in general are important. They are the architects and managers of our world's ecosystems and builders of soil and primary carbon cyclers. They release three to 10 times as much CO2 as humans do. And if we've been killing the fungi, then we've been killing the CO2 release. So there's a bigger conversation there about photosynthetic capacity and the size of the engine of photosynthesis and the fuel being CO2 and how you can always flood an engine with too much fuel um, and not enough photosynthetic capacity, not enough en en engine capacity. All plants have endophytic fungi. All plants do. And almost all plants' roots have fungal relationships critical to their survival. There are non-mycorrhizals but we've at least found one non-mycorrhizal that can partner with our muscular mycorrhizal fungi in its roots if trichoderma is there. So it begs the question, are there other partnerships in which we could unlock those relationships and unlock um, non-mycorrhizals into mycorrhizals? And maybe they're non-mycorrhizal and harming the soil because they're missing a fungi that was critically important. And because we targeted those weeds for so long with our sprays and, and chemicals and fungicides, we've killed off the indigenous microorganism that was the fungi partnership of that root. I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, we, 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 with careful study and careful observation of wild plants in these families, we very well could find that missing link and rewrite history and basically bring those non-mycorrhizals back into the mycorrhizal fold and then start healing the soils in all climates and all soil types and turn those non-reducers into reducers. So we bring the energy back in, we draw back the carbon, we, uh, and, and it all can happen. So it, 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 even, and, and, and even if, you know, we, we don't find those things, you know, I know I said it all can happen. I mean, if we found it, it all can happen. But if we don't find those things, we can put those plants in plants in a mix, and I suspect doing rows of off and on with uh, alkaline acidic, we might see some very interesting things happen in those soils um, over the course of the year. Uh, so, so I'm going to do some experiments with that to to get more information on that. But differentials drive energetic systems. All right. Externalized digestion, they release enzymes and acids and they absorb the digested result. That's critically important to realize mechanically for how they behave. So if we're like on the savanna, the lion has a kill and then all these other animals and the trophic layers are fed, that's absolutely happening as well when fungi is doing its thing because things are constantly being digested and solubilized and moved around and built and structured and because they're the architects. They're building not just the soil structure, but they're cueing and, and facilitating the, the whole successional trophic rise. And so the stability of the e e ecosystem itself, the stability of, of the trophic food chain, all of it is fungal. And, and uh, wh whether it's fungal directly or indirectly, it always is. So. So I really, I really value understanding it from a holistic cyclical point of view. And then they're decomposers of wood lignin, of course, and fibrous materials, cellulose, sole, humus, and other complex compounds. They eat what most bacteria do not. And notice I said digester of soil humus. So they turn the soil into a battery, into a storage pack. They digest it. They become it. They, they do all of the above. You see these little crystals on the sides of things, and that's them storing excess energy as well. And it's it's all happening. It's an incredibly dynamic space. Uh, fungi is, it, this is why the epifluorescence is so valuable, because you get to watch these kinds of things and see these things. If you're in Brightfield, you don't see into the organic matter in the same way. You don't see the fungi there. And... That's not to say that you can't see the fungi there because it might be the kind of fungi that's not collecting phosphorus. And so then it won't glow. And plenty of basidiomycota in the compost is 
black and brown, well, not black, but gray and brown. Uh, and probably, it probably is black, but we blast it with so much light that it looks gray. Uh, and so we have to remember that all the colors are more, more, more intense, uh, because when you blast it with light. And so we got to remember who these, 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 these microbes are and where they will be. The highway of mycelium in one cubic centimeter of undisturbed soil spans kilometers where it acts as a communication network, highway for bacteria and other life, and delivery service for plants, as well as just structure. The soil structure, the porosity, all that is formed by living, but also dead hyphae. Dead hyphae can be reabsorbed. That's why fungi can create chitinase, because it breaks down its own chitin, and then reabsorbs that and uses it elsewhere. So... When we say it's dead fungi, it's, I mean, it's, it's senesced fungi, it's aged fungi, and it's not really alive, but at any moment it could be used. And so, so it's, it's an incredible resource and we'll see it come up again soon because that, that relates. And so there's many groups in within the fungal kingdom but we're going to be focused on these certain key groups that matter to our situation. And we're going to compare them in a way that perhaps you haven't seen before. So for soil and plants, there are four of five primary interests. And it's the saprophytic, which are the decomposers, the mycorrhizal, which are the mutualists, the mycorrhizal fungal root, the endosymbionts or endophytes. They live within or in partnership with the plant. Um, and they could be on this phylosphere on the surface or in the rhizosphere and they're ubiquitous. And then there's parasites and pathogens, which are often called vocal fungi because they are coming in to show us that our plants weak in these unique ways that reflects that we haven't taken care of the soil properly or we're not managing our water or, or aeration or uh, uh, any of the five aspects of the regenerative soil components, the five components that make up regenerative soil. If any of those aren't being addressed, you'll start seeing those kinds of things show up. They are the architects of our living systems, both by creating the structure, but, but by facilitating and fostering the, the environments for secession to take place. <clears throat> but they're very separate groups they're very different and there are some overlaps functionally when we just talk about them like check out this chart so we've got some that are spore forming some that are not and then some are primarily non-spore forming right so so you have this whole world of of sp and, and the thing is the the ones that are spore forming that are endophytes have to go outside the plant to form the spores so uh, Endophytes primarily do not form spores inside the plant. The ones that are forming spores inside the plant are not good, right? Uh, and, and, and unless we're talking about mycorrhizal and those are forming spores in a good way. So we have saprophytes. They can show either characteristic. And th these things are found in specific places. Endophytes obviously can be found in the compost, outside the compost, in the rhizosphere, on the plant, inside the plant. Saprophytes, they're in the rhizosphere and in compost. And some of them can also be endophytes. But they're not mycorrhiza. They're not the mycorrhizal fungi that partners with roots. And that's really important to take in. And then the colors, many colors all over the map, right? And, and then yeasts, there's saprophytic yeast, there's, saprophy, there's endophytic yeasts. Look at the phyla, the bottom, the phyla, they're different phylum. And so the glomeri mycota, bicytomycota, they're opposite, but the ascomycota is in both saprophytes and endophytes. So we, we kind of see that some of these things do correlate. It's really important to look for correlation but also to recognize when there's like no correlation at all. And it's a little bit like being in French class or if you're an English language learner and you have to just memorize quirky things. My wife uh, grew up overseas and so she'll be like, wait, is it spelled like this? What? How does that make any sense? I'm like, it's English. You just memorize that. 
And she's like, that's not that, what, but that breaks all the other rules. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Just memorize that spelling. And keep going. <laughs> and that's, you know what I mean? That's kind of how it is with some things in life. You just have to memorize how it is. And so I point out those things where there's correlation and we can rely upon that. And I pointed out where sometimes we can potentially rely upon it. Right, right. Because we have to be nimble. We have to be open minded so that we can be ready to pivot and open our minds to a greater meaning and greater understanding always. So we see these groups. I'm going to go through these with you in more in depth, but I want you to know this is in the book. And when we think about these groupings, the timings, the place, the purpose, the bruise, the actions start to become clear because I mean, and it's not that it's not crazy wild. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi, we got to put that on as an inoculant. And if it doesn't take, we got to do soil soaks until it does. Done. Right. And it's got to be separate from the saprophytes and endophytes because they're totally different. And then you might have saprophytes that you're, you're have a saprophytic decomposer composting fermentation process that you're spiking with endophytes you know that are decomposers. Rhizobia is a decomposer. We've talked about this about a bunch of different things, right? Um, and, and one of the easiest things to do is add EM or the biofertilizers that are in the product that's called EM. And the Saccharomyces cerevisiae is right there, right? It's easy. It's bread yeast. It's it's uh, beer yeast. And so well, you could be adding that to your compost. And then suddenly you have an, a powerful endophyte. And by the way, when you're doing compost tea, yeasts are all in the air. Every, every bath has yeasts in it, right? And so that's one of the major fungi that they're talking about This that's in, on the air. And so that's why wild yeast, you put the bread on the windowsill and the wild yeast, right? Inoculate it in sourdough. Uh, and so we want to bring in those. We can bring in those. That's a great addition. But, but there might be things, because you'll see as we go through, some things are common. Some things are not common and we need, and you might find one of it, but we, there's a tendency online for people to say if something's there that it's enough of it. Those are two separate things. If a mineral is present in the soil, that's one thing. Is it present at the levels required for the plant to be healthy, radiant? You know what I mean? Like, like, what is it? it the, 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 because there is a range, and I know there's a relationship, as we talk about in regenerative soil, between the minerals and the antagonism and all those sorts of things, and the buffering of soil organic matter and all the, the above, but you get, you, get, you get it. All right, so we want to think that holistically. We want to think that dynamically. What if you could verify if your compost was actually doing its job? What if you could verify if the inoculants, the mycorrhizal inoculants and biofertilizers are actually worth the money spending on them? It is all possible. And it's all things you can learn in the Regenerative Soil Microscopy 20 week online course. If you wanna learn how to not just understand your soil, but to see that the things you're doing are actually working, that the money that you're gonna spend or, or have spent was worth it so you don't get fooled again. This is the pathway. We need holistic testing, we need holistic microscopy, and we need to combine them in a new methodology, regenerative soil microscopy. I hope you join us. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. I'll see you soon.